Good morning. So, uh, first speaker we have here for the uh, CubeSat project is uh, Mel is, is uh, Wayne McCain, and he's going to get, tell us all about the project. Thank you, Wayne. Go ahead. Okay, sir. Uh, I think I just started sharing my screen. Does everybody see that? Oops. Okay, well, uh, we're very happy to be able to bring you up to date on the STEM SAP project. And of course, it's its uh, very existence and well-being is to be credited to a large extent to Sarah. Uh, we originally presented the proposal to Sarah, I think it was at the Western Conference back in about 2016 or so. It's been, been a while, but uh, we're currently uh, marching toward a launch date that has shifted now to first quarter of next year. And I'll bring you up to date on all of that. So of course, uh, Sarah is one of our major sponsors and collaborators in the whole effort. Uh, and it's also, uh, we're very active with our local Athens State branch, student branch of American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. I guess most of you know who they are. And uh, we have about 10 or 15 students in our student branch and it varies from term to term, but that's about our average, I think. And uh, the STEM SAP project is the major ongoing project that we're doing here with our student branch. So we draw from that group of students and a lot of what we do. Starting this coming fall, we're going to be cranking up an additional project on uh, building a prototype of a Mars surface backpack for astronauts to use. And uh, we designed that uh, preliminary design on that a few years ago, presented at the Mars conference up in DC. And it's kind of been on the back burner until just recently, but that's gonna be another project within our new degree program here on aerospace systems management, but there we go. So um, as it says here, uh, we were originally scheduled to launch this fall, uh, probably middle to late December. We just met with our launch provider, which is uh, Vaya Space, V-A-Y-A Space in Cocoa, Florida. And you can uh, Google them and they have a website online and so forth. You can see what they're doing. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that. But the, uh, the launch manifest has slipped. They are in the process of completing their uh, hybrid rocket motor manufacturing facility in Coco. So they still have not manufactured and test fired the uh, rocket motor that will be part of this project. So that's going to happen within the next few months. And so it comes as no surprise to us that they're having to slip the schedule. I'll talk a little bit more about that, but I'm going to update where we are basically in the program in this presentation. I'm uh, not going to spend much time here. Most of you have uh, heard some of the presentations we've made at Sarah before, but Athens State University is a fairly unique upper division institution. I think we're one of two currently in operation in the United States. We only deal with students starting at the junior level and going through graduate programs. We have a junior, senior level for a bachelor's degrees, and then we have about a dozen uh, master's programs uh, currently uh, in play. And I suspect before very long, we'll have one or two uh, terminal degree programs in place. But uh, so we're a little bit different uh, than most universities that you run across, but uh, I have a long history. It started in 1822, survived the Civil War, has been on all girls school, a Methodist college, long history. And about mid seventies, we became part of the Alabama university system. So 
been around for a while. Okay, so this shows our uh, some of our main players here. On the left-hand side of this picture is our most recent president, uh, Dr. Philip Way. He just stepped down and went into retirement uh, about two months ago. And so we have a new person as an interim and they are doing a search for a new college president or university president right now. But uh, Dr. Way signed our launch agreement with Via Space. And the main player there is the gentleman on the right, who is uh, Robert Fabian, who is their CEO, sort of chief of engineering and all things technical. He's a retired Air Force person. So we, we've been working with them now for a couple of years, and they are proceeding on to uh, launch their first orbital mission looks like now first quarter of next year. So they are uh, our launch provider. Uh, several other people around the world uh, are participating and I'll present more on that here in a bit. Okay, so most of you know what a CubeSat is. We've uh, covered this over the years in our presentations. Smallest cube set is a four inch by four inch by four inch cube, 10 centimeter cube weighing no more than three pounds. The stem set started out as that, and we have grown to a three unit uh, configuration, which you see on the right. Uh, it is four by four inch cross section and about 12 inches in total length has uh, four uh, deployable solar panels. Uh, and I get to into the more detail there, but our unit's gonna weigh about uh, 11 pounds, it looks like. We're still flexing in that area too. The big thing about the CubeSats are that they normally ride piggyback on another commercial or DOD or NASA satellite launch. And uh, so they, uh, for the most part, are non-paying uh, ride-along sort of payloads. So uh, there's the major effort is being conducted by NASA. They have a program that solicits proposals and picks winners to ride. Uh, on a NASA ordained CubeSat mission. Ours is not directly associated with NASA. We're working directly with the launch provider uh, via space. Other CubeSats have been launched in a likewise manner. For instance, our neighbor just down the road about 20 miles, United Launch Alliance, which has the largest rocket plant in the world. They have a previously worked directly with some CubeSat builders and have launched some CubeSats there. Uh, the CubeSats must be totally self-contained and autonomous. The only interface with the launch vehicle is of course the mechanical interface. The CubeSat typically rides in some sort of payload canister or dispenser. Uh, the typical one on NASA missions is called a P-Pod which was designed by Bob Twiggs and his associate who started the CubeSat program. We, on this mission, we're responsible for our own canister and dispenser. And so we're designing and building that and supplying the CubeSat, delivering it inside the dispenser ready to mount on the main payload section. So it's gotta be self-contained. The only electrical interface, for instance, is the signals to arm the dispenser, the eject signal, and a feedback signal that says the CubeSat has left the building sort of thing. And uh, other than that, no electrical interface with the launch vehicle. This is a typical CubeSat launch that, that shows a one unit. Um, and the 
previous version of the Vaya launch vehicle is shown to the right. They have updated their design in about the last month and a half or two months. And I'll talk about that. I have a picture of the new one, but I don't have it in this presentation as yet, but I'll describe what it is. Uh, but basically the CubeSats ride along with the main payload and are normally released after the main payload customer, you know, the paying customer payload is released into orbit and far enough out of the way that the CubeSat won't collide with it or anything like that. I might mention that some CubeSats, a large number actually have been launched off of the International Space Station. And that's another way you can get a CubeSat launched is it goes up in a, a fairly large package of several CubeSats and they have a P-Pod set up on the space station where they can release it into orbit. There's some interesting videos on YouTube that show CubeSats being ejected by the space station crew. So that's pretty cool. Okay, so our mission primary objective is a STEM activity, um, science, technology, engineering, and math. Uh, we are trying to involve as many students in our project as possible in the overall mission planning, the ground station operations, uh, data reduction and correlation, hardware and software development, building the CubeSat, testing it, launching it, so forth. So that is the main objective. So once we deliver the CubeSat to the launch provider, our primary objective has been met because at that point, uh, everything that the students have initially done is complete. Uh, the secondary objective is the science experiment, basically, which is the radio uh, astronomy receiver at uh, very low frequencies. And so the students are also involved in establishing receiving stations across the world uh, to receive the uh, 434 megahertz downlink of the received VLF signals. And Mel's going to talk about some of the sort of things that we expect to receive and uh, later on in his presentation. And then the secondary objective number two is the health and welfare of the satellite and its subsystems that will be part of the downlink and I can describe a little bit of that, how that works later. We have lots of collaborators um, around the world basically uh, and some of them of late are not shown on this chart. Uh, for instance, we have a very large group of students in Brazil who are going to be participating and their logo and group is not shown on here but Mel is here representing the University of North Alabama. And then we have people from, that we've collaborated with from Vandy. They're not actively participating at the moment, but they've provided a lot of uh, support in the past. Calhoun Community College up there is a two year school just down the street from us, about 10 miles, 10 or 12 miles. They are very active in the program and they are currently updating all of our CubeSat drawing package. They're also uh, documenting the design of the dispenser or a little canister that the CubeSat will be in. They're, they're working on that right now. So we've um, had several uh, groups of students and basically in their aerospace uh, two-year program there, mainly in manufacturing and computer-aided design is their expertise and that's where they're working. Uh, we've worked some with uh, David Fields from uh, Rome State up in Knoxville, although not lately. Uh, David's doing some independent stuff with uh, developing a receiver and other things. They've been launching balloons to support that. Uh, we have a group in Georgia at the museum, Macon Museum of Arts and Sciences. Of course, we're working with AMSAT and they have been very 
uh, active in helping us and uh, a lot of the software and even some of the hardware for our CubeSat is coming directly from AMSAT efforts. Then Spark Academy is one of our local uh, elementary schools. My daughter, Amelia, went there several years ago and they specialize in uh, STEM activities. It's a STEM school uh, in science, engineering, and math. So uh, Jennifer Kennedy, who's the main driver there, there we've already briefed them. They are, have their antenna system built. They're using a little handheld radio as the receiver, and we're helping them with the software, which is basically derived from Jim Sky's uh, Radio Jove uh, software to download and uh, save the data and so forth. So this is typical of the group. We uh, have several college level groups up at the very top there. Uh, Central Alabama Community College is uh, building their own CubeSat simulator. They uh, have their receiving data station already in place. So this is just typical of uh, of how we're working with things. So as I said, our uh, unit is gonna be a four by four by 12 inch cube set. The main frame and so forth is 3D printed. We're doing most of that here at uh, Athens State. We're using a carbon fiber impregnated nylon filament, which is two to three times stronger than most of the uh, types of filament you see, the ABS, PLA, PETG, all that, very good, but the nylon carbon impregnated is much stronger, and that's what we're using for the flight hardware. All of our uh, engineering model that we're, we've built this is built from the earlier materials that I mentioned, and we've switched into the nylon carbon for the flight hardware. It will have four deployable uh, solar panels. Uh, right now, we're, our current power budget says we don't need them to be double-sided. Those probably end up being single-sided solar panels that produce about 18 watts in a full uh, illuminated environment. And so we are looking at using now uh, high capacity lithium batteries. Uh, we have about a 10 amp hour pack in our engineering model. Depending on range safety requirements, we were just told this week that, oh, by the way, yeah, you are subject to all the, the NASA range safety limitations. And whereas before they were saying, well, don't worry about that because we may be launching offshore Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. But now they're launching from a NASA launch pad at uh, well, it's a Cape Canaveral Space Force System launch facility at, at Cape Canaveral. So we we're probably going to have to revisit that. So all the printed wiring boards, PC boards are inserted as a stack. It turns out from both ends of the spacecraft frame uh, includes sus subsystems like the power. A battery pack, the receivers, the computer, uh, transmitter and power amplifier, all those sort of things are basically built up and uh, inserted into the frame. We did have on our engineering model, we have a two piece frame so that you could actually assemble the boards and all the other components and then assemble the frame around it. But we're, we've got a new 3D printer coming in at any day now that will allow us to build the frame as one piece. And uh, so we'll we will be inserting it from the various ends. Uh, something I'm, I wanted to mention was that the receiving and transmitting antennas are on opposite ends of the spacecraft. The receiving antenna is on the upper what would be the pointed towards space end of the spacecraft where the solar, solar panels are hinged and the transmitting antenna, which is a small 430 megahertz dipole made out of uh, metal 
tape measure things like AMSAT does, it's on the opposite end and it's deployed along with the solar panel. So we can talk more about that. This is kind of a disassembled view. I hesitate to use the word exploded, but it, it is a, uh, a disassembly of the spacecraft. The big, the big thing at the bottom of the spacecraft is the battery pack. Uh, not shown here is the RF amplifier, which sits right under the battery pack next to the transmitting antennas. Then on top of that is a, and on top of the main battery pack is going to be a separate battery pack dedicated to deploying the solar panels and such. Uh, and then all the, we've got two computer related boards, uh, the receiving board, the sensor uh, conditioning boards and so forth that interface with the receiver. And we have, um, we're, planning to have a GPS module on there, an inertial measurement unit. And uh, all that was to help support Mel's goal of being able to know which direction the satellite was pointed for e any given data bit. And I think we've about decided now, based on their studies, that it's kind of be a whole sky radioometer and that might not be required, but we may still have that data anyways uh, available, we'll see. And then the receiver, and finally, the very top of the board stack is gonna be the receiving antenna. And we're looking at various configurations and testing various configurations of a ferrite, uh, either combination of uh, ferrite rods or a toroid, uh, type receiving antenna based on a ferrite toroid. We got some really good information from unclassified, recently unclassified CIA information where they did, believe it or not, a lot of research on using a toroid type receiving antenna. And so we're, we're looking at that. This is an assembled look at what the satellite looks like. Four solar panels at the top, transmitting antenna up at the, in the middle of the upper section, and then the transmitting antenna at the very bottom of the CubeSat. So uh, we have completed our standard drawing package. It's being updated now, as I mentioned. We're trying to put together a document that Mel is long awaited on the technical description of the design, uh, all the specs on everything. And they're working on that again, helping us with that at Calhoun. All the electrical design, except for a few little uh, side requirements uh, have been completed. Uh, this November date was November last year. We didn't make that, and it looks like it might be May before we actually begin the uh, environmental testing, which includes everything. Uh, we've got the one unit simulator completed, and I think we demonstrated that to some of the SARA group uh, last December online. Uh, we have an, a full-scale engineering model and integration aid that is basically complete with the exception of mounting, uh, integrating the receiver. And as I said, uh, we are redesigning the receiver board, although we can force fit almost the existing board that we've trimmed down from uh, the UK RAA. Uh, but anyways, we hope to get all that done and start environmental hot coal vibration and shock testing at Dynetics in Huntsville uh, early summer at the latest. Uh, May 2023 is our, our projected date as shown there with the last bullet. And that's with Dynetics and Adtran. I know most of you have heard of Dynetics. Adtran um, is a local ele electronics specialty company that uh, evolved from 
a the original one of the original modem companies they built the original modems for many 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 of the systems and now they do a lot more than that and they're a very large company with a lot of capability so kind of to wrap it up uh the cubesat projects and there are many of them around the country as a matter of fact the university of alabama tuscaloosa just announced a few weeks ago that their CubeSat project is moving forward. Uh, others in the state have done some, but it offers a great opportunity to involve students in science, technology, engineering, math. There's also an effort to include the arts, which makes it STEAM instead of STEM. And uh, one of the things our group here are AIAA student branch is working with our career development group here at the university. We are building a portable STEM trailer where we, and the theme of that's going to be lost in space. And uh, so basically we'll have a portable satellite receiving station in a trailer uh, along with other things like 3D printing and uh, even some uh, model rocketry and stuff that we're going to be visiting as many of the local elementary and middle schools and even high schools that we can to bring the STEM experience to them. So it all offers a great opportunity for education. Uh, the VLF signals that Mel is going to talk about a bit later are signals that are basically blocked from space by Earth's atmosphere but can be received to some degree, depending on the orbit altitude uh, by a satellite. And so what we're doing, we're receiving a VLF signal and that data is being basically encoded in a telemetry signal in terms of flux level. And that data transmitted back on a 434 70 centimeter ham band uh, that does penetrate the atmosphere. So that's the science experiment part of it. Then the agreement is in place with Via Space uh, and it is now scheduled as of this week for first quarter of next year instead of fourth quarter of this year. So we're actually thankful for that slip. And as I mentioned prior to giving the formal presentation, our comments to value was, please take your time. <laughs> we are not in a rush. So uh, it's probably going to be first, first quarter, at least, if not later of next year that we will launch. So we're, we're moving along. We did receive thank, um, much appreciation of Sarah Grant in December of this past year, which we have used to purchase the components for our flight hardware and some supporting stuff. So we really appreciate that. And uh, we will be reporting constantly, formally, I think, to Sarah. So that's basically the presentation. So any questions at this point? There, there are two questions on chat. Um, from WIT, what is the significance of 20.1 kilohertz in your secondary science mission? I don't recognize that station frequency. Yeah, 20.1, I think, uh, is sort of in between some of the existing uh, beacons and other sources uh, on Earth. Uh, one thing I didn't mention, and I meant to mention more, is that we are baselining a VLF receiver from the United Kingdom Radio Astronomy Association, UKRAA, and uh, they operate, their receiver operates in that range. It's like between 10 and 30 kilohertz. And so we just sort of pick 20 as middle of the road. And it's in between, I believe, uh, some of the existing beacons. Uh, we can also, it's a tunable receiver, so that frequency selection is changeable pretty much, but that's the 
frequency range that we're looking at is in the 10 to probably 30 or certainly less than 100 kilohertz range. Okay. Um, from Jay Wilson, what is the expected lifetime of the CubeSat? Another very good question. Um, we met with the AMSAT people who were here last year, last summer at the Huntsville Ham Fest. They, they did a, had a big group here. And uh, a lot of the NASA CubeSats are being launched in fairly low Earth orbits that limits their lifespan to three to six months. Uh, we are going to be launched into a 500 kilometer orbit. We do not have any deorbit capability on our spacecraft. So we still haven't gotten the detailed trajectory information from our launch provider, but it could last a year or more. So um, we're hoping that that's the case, but it will not be a real short term proposition. It could be a year or longer. Uh, that it will be in orbit. Now, whether or not the, uh, the spacecraft survives that length of time in terms of radiation, exposure, heat and cold, exposure, so forth, of course, we, we don't know, although we're looking into that now. But the orbit okay. should be stable for, we think, at least a year. Okay, my God has two questions. Uh, what sensors are on board, temperature, battery, voltage, altitude, and uh, any method of stabilization like in physical design? Uh, yes, there are a lot of uh, sensors on board for temperature, pressure, um, and I'll, I can provide that information at, at a later time, but uh, yes, there will be that. As I also mentioned, we intend to have a GPS module and a inertial measurement unit module as part of the sensors on board. And uh, so we'll have a lot of that information. We monitor solar cell, solar panel, basically solar panel output, battery voltage, uh, power usage state of the battery packs, all that sort of thing are part of the telemetry that will come down routinely. And the way this is going to work is uh, there will be a continuous broadcast of data. And each time it goes through the loop, you'll get all of that health and wellness uh, data along with the uh, receiver data. And it will recycle about every couple of minutes. So it, it's a interesting setup, but it's based on some of the hardware and software that we were able to get from AMSAT. Uh, any method of stabilization like in physical, oh, the physical right. design? The only thing we have is a very passive sort of thing where we've located the largest mass part of the satellite in the end that we hope will eventually stabilize out pointing toward the earth based on gravity effects we don't have any active stabilization or attitude control and uh, we've uh, of course have a ongoing question into the launch provider as to what what uh, dynamic state are you predicting for the payloads that you're putting into orbit so we don't know that but there's a good chance that the satellite will be spinning or tumbling in orbit at least for a while or a long while, uh, but we don't know that. Uh, we're hoping that's not the case, but we don't have any active control. And by the way, our satellite is autonomous. We do not have an uplink. There is no capability to uplink commands or whatever to our satellite. It's totally autonomous. And uh, so part of our software development is going to be uh, reboot uh, capability and that sort of thing of all the software on the satellite. And, and sort of a follow on from, from me is the, uh, um, since you are gonna be tumbling, uh, have you accounted for that in your solar uh, reception budget? Our, 
approach so far has been basically an overkill. Uh, we're still working on the power budget, uh, Rich, but we, we currently have a 10 amp hour battery pack and an 18 watt solar, total solar panel charging capability. Our, our system is going to be drawing only a few hundred milliamps. So we can only hope that uh, regardless of the orientation of the spacecraft that we'll be, uh, we'll have enough uh, power on board to account for that, but we're it, uncertain. It, it, might, it might be worth putting uh, the dual sided uh, on just so it'll double your uh, capability of uh, getting solar power, no matter what the orientation. Yes, sir. That's that's certainly a possibility, and that that is our original plan to have the solar panels double sided, and it's not a big deal to do that. So, most likely, we will do that. Okay. Uh, anybody else have any questions? I got a question. Okay. <clears throat> Ms. Kurt. So back early in the days of when they started putting satellites in space, so like back in the '60s, I understand that they had. A satellite that had flexible um, antennas, and as those antennas would flex, uh, unexpectedly it redistributed the energy to the point where it put the satellite in a mode where it was tumbling. So obviously that's a long time ago. Have we learned now how to put satellites into space so that we don't get these unanticipated modes? Is there some modeling that can be done, or is it just it's been done so long that everyone knows how to do it right. Mm -hmm. Well, I hope it's the latter, but I can tell you this, um, our configuration basically has been adopted directly from what AMSAT has had success with. We're using their recommended antenna configuration for the transmitter. Our antenna for the receiver is going to be fixed and actually inside the spacecraft uh, and not flexible. So the only thing that's gonna be flexible will to some degree will be the solar panels and the transmitting antenna. The transmitting antenna is a little uh, dipole antenna made from a fairly stiff low mass tape measure uh, materials and um, Again, this is what AMSAT has used and recommends, but part of what we are doing is developing, of course, the center of gravity and moment of inertia uh, data. Our Calhoun people are doing that with some of their modeling of the spacecraft. So we will have a, a, some capability to analyze that, but that data is not available as yet. But we think we're good because we're going with a common design that's been successful uh, with the AMSAT, uh, Fox satellites and others. Uh, so we're not reinventing the wheel there, but th that's a really good point. Uh, All right, uh, anybody else have any questions? 